Ladies and gentlemen of the Tauvar, how is everybody feeling today? I hope you're excited. I sure as shit know that I am. Let's introduce the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. SMS and Railgun himself, you absolute fucking mad lad. Uh, everybody, Commander Pure Tide, Carl Grundy, our rank one ITC. How you doing, buddy? Um, not bad, man. Not bad. Taking, uh, taking names. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, I have realized that I've started the stream yet again, uh, without my headphones and I don't want any doubling up for our wonderful viewers at home. So for anybody who doesn't know what, who you are, while I run off and grab that, uh, could you please give us an introduction and let people know what you're about? You'll see a link down below you in the stream to the Pure Tide program. Kyle, uh, run the beautiful people through what that is. And I will be running to go and get some headphones. No worries. Well, I'm just a guy who happened to uh, fall upon Tau. Um, no, I'm um, a competitive Tau player. I um, have been playing Tau for 24 years. Run my own coaching service with the Pure Tide program. And uh, yeah, that is pretty much in a nutshell. Um, the ITC tournaments are huge. They're everywhere. And uh, most of the events that I go to are in the UK. But I have been starting to branch out across Europe and the US. Perfect timing. I can stop uh, rambling now, Jay. You got your headphones? Mate, no, no, not yet. Just to ramble. Got to gotta swap them over. Hopefully the uh, the Pixel Buds do their work. But, uh, <laughs> mate, I'll, uh, I'll do a little bit of talking because that won't double up on everybody. Uh, because not only have I had Kyle on here before, apologies, that window wasn't supposed to come up in front of you guys. Um, but uh, having Kyle on before, I noticed that there was a lot that Kyle and I were doing that was uh, very, very similar. Uh, and I will have a video coming out very, very soon because I just ran uh, what was the only sold out teams event in Sydney and is looking like it may actually be the biggest event to run until the major uprising in next January. Uh, but there was a lot of uh, sportsmanship sort of stuff that came up. I did have to eject somebody from the venue uh, for certain behaviors. But it's one thing that I noticed that uh, Kyle and I shared a disdain for that sort of stuff. And I knew when I saw his video, uh, which I will make sure that I get links in the chat as Kyle has broken down his list and his tricks and all of his, you know, stuff, thinking about it, even going as far as like uh, the start of the video, you open up with going through the terrain pack, which I think is a mm. very, very important thing for a lot of Tau players to do, to wrap their head around everything that, you know, makes a top level player pick a certain thing. And we are going to be talking about some very, very spicy stuff. So uh, after you're done with this stream, and if you like what you've seen, make sure you go over, show the Pure Type Program uh, YouTube channel some love. And uh, yeah, Carl's Discord is absolutely free to go and have a look at what the Pure Type Program is doing. It is absolutely fantastic. Uh, so with all of that rambling out of the way, uh, one plug that I do have to do for myself because everybody loves I everybody knows I love plugging myself. Uh, we are running on the back of that event a raffle, which you'll see some stuff just on for me. Uh, there is the link down below me where you can type that in, or the link will be in the YouTube description to my website where we're selling the raffle tickets. This is open to Australians or international people. Uh, Third place is a personalized Pantheon Studios merch pack made by my absolutely amazing wife with the new stuff that we've invested into. Second place is a more than premium painting kit, which a lot of people were salivating over at the event. Uh, and first place, if you're in Australia, is oh well, it starts with two Chaos Space Marine Joy Toy figures. And on top of that, your choice of either, if you're an Australian, uh, a free ticket to any event that I run, GTs, maybe a major coming up, maybe a team's tournament, or Discord access, as well as a two-hour coaching session with me, or your choice of playing a full game of 40k with me on Tabletop Simulator from wherever you are in the world. This will be open for one week. We'll be drawing it live, myself and my wife, on stream. We had a lot of fun doing that last time. So if you would like to secure yourself some tickets, there is no upper limit to how much somebody can get. Best of luck to everybody. Mate, that is all of the plugging from me. Uh, but I have noticed that my stream chat is definitely not big enough. And it is not going to let me change it. Oh, no, there we go. There we go. Let's have this actually fill the window. 
And I want to say a massive hello to Dukas Fatstool, uh, Alexander Loft, uh, Mr. Pure Tide in chat himself. Uh, Dennis, I'm hoping I say that correct. Masu, always great to see you. Hello to everybody that is in chat. Uh, Carl, mate, let's get straight into it because your list is... I want to call it interesting, but I don't know if that's the sort of thing that would get me slapped in the Tau community. So could you please run through exactly what you went? Because it was the Goonhammer Open, which it's my understanding is a fucking shark tank and a half. And you took second place, only going down to first place and only dropping like, it was like, what, eight points against him? 11 points. Which, on a loss, like, that's barely a loss. Mm. Oh, wait, hang on. Sorry, Carl. I think my headphone's going in. I'm not seeing the bounce. Let's do that. Uh, luckily, everybody, you didn't miss too much. Uh, okay. So... Ah, oh, motherfucker, it's not coming up with it as a an output. Okay, you know what we're going to do? We're just going to go wide. I tried to go fancy with technology. Uh, all the Tower fans waiting for Mr. Pure Tide to speak, I apologize. Uh, we're going to just change this over. I am sorry. Yeah, Carl, dance for the people. Thank you. Uh, it gave, did give me a good chance to stand up. Because you'll see the birthday present that Chelsea did for me. Have a look at this. Uh... I'm not going to say that this will be available as a merch item very, very soon, but it absolutely will be. Uh, <laughs> all right, so let's go back to that. Take these out. Go to Discord. Professional streamer, by the way, everybody. 100%. You know it's true. All right, talk for me, buddy. Testing, one, two, three. Mate, that Testing is one. perfect. All right, we only missed a couple of words from you. Uh, let's go again. Shark Tank, right. second place, Shark. barely dropping a point with 11 points. Mate, yeah. let's go. Let's go. Let's go. All right, okay, yeah. So, um, absolute Shark Fest. I knew it was going to be um, big names there. You got Jack Tight, Nassim, Josh Roberts. Oh, they're just loads of people. So, it was going to be a really good event, really competitive. And I thought, well sod it i'm gonna take something different after our previous video we did joke about hammerheads i was like god damn it jay <laughs> and then in the back of my mind when i was creating my list i was like ah did i just say that on the stream fuck oh well here we go let's ride the railgun wave and um then i started to look a little bit deeper so without further ado i'll go into the list so I start my list, primaries, secondaries, tertiaries, did the whole, you know, normal routine. Got in my three breacher fish. Then I went into the secondaries. And I thought, sub tetras, if I'm not taking cry suits, you're going in the bin too, right? Sling it out of the way, don't care about them. And I went pathfinders, so it was, um, in fact, I'll do it in a bit more of a succinct way. So the characters, I went with uh, Shadow Sun. I went with Commander Longstrike with a railgun. And he was armed with his two SMS. Then I had Dark Strider because it's not the Grundy maneuver without him. Of and course. Then I went with an XB8 commander with four cyclics, two shield drones, no precision of the hunter. I just couldn't afford it. Well, oh, that does happen. Yeah, uh, I've been there. Points, I've been there. 20 points I couldn't find, otherwise I would have done. But then it was triple breach of fish and with Guardian drone, gun drone. <laughs> then I went in with um, two Pathfinder squads armed with my typical loadout, which is triple ion rifles. Gun drone, shield drone, recon drone, and the semi-automatic grenade launcher, which I think I fired once. Dude, I, I keep forgetting it. mine. I keep fucking yeah. forgetting mine. I, I, I came sixth at a GT. I forgot to fire it every single fucking game. I don't know what yeah. it is about that gun that just goes over my head. I well, <laughs> I remember, I remember to fire my recon drone, and I remember to fire my gun <laughs> drone. <laughs> the grenade launcher. Nah. So no, of course not. Why, why would you? <laughs> So to round out the rest of the list, I thought, well, Triptide baby, let's give somebody real PTSD from the past. Here's hammer Hammerheads with Railguns, here's Triple Riptide. The Triple Riptide were armed with Ion Cannons, SMS, and the two Missile Drones. And then I thought, well, okay, cool. Ghosties. 
let's put two go skills in there. So you touched on it at the very beginning there by saying about the pack. And I went through the pack because that's really important. That is the planning stage. Let's have a look at the tournament. Let's have a look at the pack. Let's have a look at the rules. What am I going up against? Where? What is the platform? Okay, brilliant. Build around the platform. So the ghost kills were absolutely phenomenal because a lot of their missions, the Goonhammer um, uh, design team with the terrain had done something very clever. And I love the way that they're innovating. They decided to do something about the homers problem, the deploy teleport homers. So they modified the GW layout three and layout four to make it so that there wasn't just this easy L or big staging area just to do homers all game with a trading piece. They adjusted it so that that was not a thing, allowing people to kind of not just worry about someone going homers, 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 homers. Mm. So I really liked that. So then I thought, okay, cool. Then SMS is going to be brilliant. My ghost kills and some of the missions, the uh, objectives were out in the open. So loan up and powerful defensive loan ups is going to be key. So the ghost kills made a uh, an appearance. I took the cyclic iron raker, the fusion blaster, and the support system to fall back and shoot. Mm. So the key thing is, and I've said this in my video, is designing the list around smart missile systems, anti tank for a package of long strike and a hammerhead is two hundred and seventy points. Mm. Now that was really key because. I love broadsides. Do not get me wrong. Broadsides are sick. The damage that they do is phenomenal. Combine it with Tetras. You just go point click, get off my board, son. But there comes with a tax. There's a tax to this. 180 points for a broadside unit. 80 points for a Tetra. That's already 260 points. Or I could just take long strike and hammerhead and it's 270. Now, the rest of the list is designed in such a way that I wanted to stat check people. Here's 50 infantry. Right, perfect. Here's two ghost skills. T8, blanks, stealth, lone operative. Here's three riptides. T9, four up in vulnerable save. Okay, 14 wounds. Here's three devilfish. T9, 13 wounds, three up saves. And here's two hammerheads. T10. 14 wounds so there's not one gun that can deal with all of these it forces people to actually make decisions and how are they going to tackle said threats ghost kills got to come close right hammerheads well you're not getting close um <laughs> riptides ghost kills can bully and then my infantry can screen those units as well so the list was designed around stat checking and then smart missile systems annoyingly the smart missile systems are different you look at the profiles, Long Strike has got eight shots, Hammerhead's got six, Devilfish has got four, Riptides have got three. It's just like, my God, okay, fine. But SMS, hitting on fives, rerolling ones around Shadow Sun, Hammerhead's having an eight reroll. So then the efficiency starts to go from, oh, it's shit on paper to actually it's going to connect. And then the twin linked aspect of it. So as soon as you hit, not a problem. You're going to be wounding. Turn three comes about, sustain hits two. Nice. Even if you're split firing and hitting on sixes, long strike, eight shots. With reroll ones and maybe a free reroll, if you've already connected with the other stuff, guess what? You're going to get at least one six, which become three hits. And if you're hitting on fives, you're going to get three hits anyway. So it's the same efficiency. And if you spike for a couple of sixes and on stream, spoiler alert, I happen to roll just nothing but sixes with SMS for some garden of <laughs> unreason against Grey Knight. It didn't matter. Yep. But it all adds up when you start to think about <clears throat> the application of it. And with sustain hits too, it just goes through the roof. And I was constantly putting pressure on their scoring units. So mm. the list, stat check. I will indirect all your scoring pieces. And with 30 inch range, I can hit you wherever you are on the board. So I liked it. And then, yeah. It mm. did very well. I was taking for guard and Eldar. Round one, guard. Round two, Eldar. I was like, well, going strong, eh? <laughs> now, for anybody who's not familiar with what Kyle was talking about with getting the uh, double exploding sixes, you might say, oh, but indirect, you're not being guided. No, that's where Kyle mentioned the split fire. All that is necessary for you to get sustain hits too on all of your guns, no matter who you're shooting, is that you are guided into somebody. 
I could fire with a crisis brick, one cyclic ion blaster into a dude and then send 63 shots at some other poor unit that I'm hitting on fives. But I, all it says is that you are a guided unit, not that you are targeting your spotted unit. So that is how you will do it. You put the rail gun into somebody that you really want to say bye-bye to and then SMS go and do their thing. A man, long strike took some names. Oh my God, it was good to watch him work. And out of the six rounds, you know, there's a lot of um, people out there being like, I love hammerheads, they're great. But the amount of times I've goddamn rolled a wad into a one, it's depressing. And they're going, yeah, and okay, it happens. And it did happen to me once out of the six rounds but that's statistically average and the amount and on stream i know i'm sat here going trust me guys it's fine it happens <laughs> deal with it but then on stream i might have rolled a fair few sixes to wound kind of consistently in that game and i was of like of course yes. you did of course you did <laughs> oh, red night there it'd be a real shame if i was to take 12 wounds off it with one shot <laughs> <laughs> And and that's and that's something that uh, you know, like I have not been a fan of hammerheads, and I know that after doing this, after doing this stream, you've opened me up to this, Kyle. That people are going to creep back into the comments. I see. I told you, hammerheads were good, but the thing is that hammerheads were always okay. One, they were outshone by other things that were within the same bracket that they were. But two, isn't it funny how the meta shifts around us, even if nothing for us changes? The same way that it did for Pathfinders, the same way the Ghost Kills fell out of favor. Do you remember taking Firesight Marksman at the start of the edition, Kyle, and then just never again? Well, I saw this everywhere. Everywhere taking Firesights. And then all of a sudden, we see absolutely none. And it's because nothing changed for us. But other people did. And I saw you doing a breakdown of the number of units that are currently being taken mm. in the meta that actually have an invulnerable save. And compared yep. to the start of the edition, there's not actually a lot of people doing it. No, and also, like, it's... I think the one good position that um, I take for granted in being in the UK is that there is so much competition out there and you learn so much by just repetition into good players and armies and you start to kind of notice patterns and in anything when something becomes a pattern then you can work around that and do something different to break that kind of mold of like okay people are constantly taking x y and z x y and z and tau players are taking x crisis suits blah 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 and they predicted the triple riptide because it's inevitable mm. so being able to suddenly go actually I'm going to have conviction and go in with a concept that people will not have predicted. That It actually gives you an advantage because people have sussed out what they think you're going to take and suddenly you turn up with something different. They're like, oh, God damn it. God damn it, Kyle. <laughs> and and kind of that's what happened. They were like, hammerheads, railguns. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and and that is actually it's it's funny you mention that because like there are some events that I go to that I know that nobody's going to be trying to predict me. So being chaotic when nobody's trying to predict you might not actually achieve anything for me. But if I were to say, for example, if I were to travel internationally and I would go into something like LVO or to come over for the Goonhammer Open, you know, when I'm Mr. YouTube and I've got money to actually travel in a world going to shit. Um, but I probably would start going down a similar line where, you know, I, I would have to start knowing, and this will happen like, you know, if I ever put my hand up again to represent either my state or Australia for WTC or ATC respectively, um, that I would have to start doing that. I would have to anticipate that people are going to want to, I, uh, you know, work out what it is that I'm doing and work out what they might try and counter and then be ahead of that and, and just be pure fucking chaos that they cannot keep up with. And I think that that is a very, very admirable trait. And I think it's something that really does, you know, put you into a league of your own that you're constantly thinking about that. And yes, it's a byproduct of the UK, but I also don't think you could have gotten to our rank one if you weren't doing that as sort of like a baseline. So yeah, that's very, very, very interesting. 
Uh, and there's and there's, some, and, and there's um, anybody can uh, do this to some extent. You don't have to actually go to events. Obviously, getting practice in person will help. But the Stat Check uh, website by the guys called Stat Check is phenomenal. You can go on there, and I I look at this almost like a bible uh, every week when the updates there. I'm looking at the meta, and I'm looking at the top three. So if I want to potentially do well at an event and podium, I have to be able to beat those top three armies because they are going to be represented because they are the top of the meta. And we call them meta change, meta chasers, but people that obviously are highly competitive and want to do well and maybe just love using different armies will be taking these factions. So you have to prep for them. But then the other thing is you have to prep for what we call the mid-table menaces. So those armies that are trying to push through and innovate with like different armies that are not quite there on the top tier, but potentially could just jump these S tiers by teching accordingly. So you have actually got to prepare for the mid-range ones like your Death Guard, your Chaos Knights, your Drakari, um, all these kind of armies. that, are, And then also you've got to understand players that are going to the event that you might see constantly that have a particular style. So there's so many different kind of layers to your preparation. And it starts with knowing the meta, watching videos, going on the stat check website, having a look and pre-planning that before you're creating your list. So preparation for the tournament pack, preparation for the meta, all of that has gone into before I've even put pen on paper you know, or creating the, creating the list concept itself. So it starts with an idea, evolves with then applying what you found out to which units you're taking. Mm. And it, it's funny. You, it's funny you mentioned meta chasing because, in my opinion, being a competitive player requires some amount of meta chasing. There is no way to get around it. And really, like, are you going to have somebody be like, "Oh my god, I can't believe Usain Bolt was running as fast as he could. What a what what a fucking hack!" You know, like. <laughs> Like, and it's, I, I think where meta chasing gets confused with what competitive players really have to do in general is that, you know, it's when somebody is just constantly changing faction and changing their army and particularly selling an army and then buying a new one and not just leaving it on the shelf for another time and not actually learning the old army and only being able to see any success because they're using stuff which is very obviously too strong and they're not somebody who's like, all right, I'm going to invest in this. I'm going to become a master of it. I'm going to learn all the tricks. I'm going to do whatever. And then if there's something which is statistically better or even just sometimes like, you know, you can be like a meta chaser because you've been playing the same thing for a year and you're like, oh, you know what? This is out. It's got some cool new rules. I really like the look of it. I'll probably be able to win some tournaments with it. I'm going to take that. And so I, I think that it is a kind of a, a paste all uh, of, of, of a, a term but to some degree, if you want to be successful, you do have to chase the meta. And in a way, that for us, that's going to Riptides, maybe over Ghost Kills when the points drops first went down. Or seeing a map pack and being like, no, Ghost Kills have to be here. Or being like, I'm a fucking super genius with a, you know, my brain can't, my skull can't hold my brain. I'm going to take Ghost Kills and Riptides. And I would like to point out two things. One, in our last stream, Kyle, you did say if you take Ghost Kills, you're a hack exact wording like direct quote this that is exactly what came out of your mouth i'm not elaborating at all uh <laughs> and two uh it was my birthday yesterday happy birthday to me happy birthday to you. <laughs> just want to throw that in there not a shameless plug at all but uh yeah woke up to the shirt i'm wearing but anyway uh let's get back to the topic of ghost kills because i love using ghost kills and i want to see if you felt the same because obviously previous lists you didn't have a need for them and then filling a need for this and i know we're not talking rail guns and sms but we will get there but when i start looking at building a hammerhead based list i struggle to not include ghost kills because i know that hammerheads are going to be in my experience they are the first thing that everybody worries about and so if i'm you know, having to angle in a way that you do in like turn one and two, because you don't want to lose them straight away to any sort of counter fire. So you will just, you know, peek the rail out over the tightest, tightest line to get line of sight, but not open it up to the board. So if I've got stuff that can just go out there and exist and get me points, and if they're so worried about that hammerhead, yeah, cool, no problem. You're not committing things that can deal with the T8 body to the, the ghost kill. You're committing it to long range fire over the board. I'm just going to score every primary and secondary that I want. 
Um, and I'm interested, aside from how the Ghost Kills perform for you and if your opinion has shifted because the meta shifted, uh, your choice of the cyclics over the fusions. Because I have recently fallen in love with the fusion collider. So I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Let's start with Ghost Kill performance and then let's go to their big swing and gun. Yeah, so basically I wanted on quite an open board to be just have some units that can consistently do what I want them to do. You know, I want them to do secondaries. I want them just to bait them to come and, you know, try and take my primary away. I wanted something that I could just bully the scoring by going, if you don't stop me, I'll be doing all the secondaries. And then actually, um, they were quite good over the course of the game um, with the damage, the shooting. Um, but I found that achieving secondaries with the fallback and shoots, then I've got triple riptide, triple, uh, double ghost kill, all being able to fall back and do actions. So points win games, not guns. So having that consistent unit to do that, and even spending you know stratagems to insane bravery uh, once per game on a ghost kill that's taken shitload of incoming damage and goes, okay, I'll go and do that action for you. Um, so I like that, and I think it was heavily... Um, well, it was needed in the tournament pack because, like I said, it would, they had some open spaces and one of the missions was the ritual. So having a ghost kill go, run up and go, right, ritual, then take loads of fire because he's gone into the open and then it's like, all right, actually now I'm on a low amount of wounds and then I'll just run away and then fire and fade it and run further away and have loads of screens in front. And the ghost kill is like, you can't see me, see you later, I'm out of here, I've done my job. Like, it's that kind of thing. So, um, and I think... One thing I really liked and I was doing in quite a few games was when the opponent was taking Bring It Down against me, actually using the Ghost Kills to bait out and go, come and get the Bring It Down points. And they'd obviously go for it because they can see that the rest of the vehicle is at the back of the board and it's going to be quite a slog to get there. But then, like I said, I would just go, oh, you didn't kill a Ghost Kill. All right, see ya. And they're like, God damn it, come back. And they're going, nope, I want nothing to do with that. So I could be super annoying. And I would say that, yes, some people have called me a genius for the Dark Strider thing and all that, 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 but I'm just a cheeky motherfucker. Gu guilty. I'm, guilty. <laughs> I, 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 I'm just a cheeky motherfucker. I like being annoying. I have been called annoying throughout my life. Love your mum, but you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm annoying. Um, and anybody that's like, you're so annoying. And I, I like to do that within the game because... It's just these little tactical decisions that can cause failure points in your opponent's mm. battle plan. And if they're relying on bring it down with the ghost kills, they're not easy to kill. And if you do manage to kill one, you've probably committed quite a lot of your army to do that. And then the riptides go, hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I actually and found then, with ghost kills, I was running them towards corners quite a lot. And people would be like, oh, why are you moving over there? And I'm like, well, he's done his job. And if you want to try and come out here, by all means. But I'm just going to run back to that objective when I'm ready. If you if you yeah. leave him, he's just going to do his thing and you have to walk towards me to a corner to get in range to shoot me. That ain't the direction you want to go because there's, you know, more than 1,800 points sitting on this side of the board, which is the opposite direction to which he went. You're like, make a choice. That's cool. Setting them up for secondaries I quite like as well. So... Mm. I think a, a strenuous part of um, enacting a battle plan um, when you get to the table with your opponent and you know what you're up against is thinking, okay, well, if I'm going tactical, which, by the way, the, there was only one mission I went fixed, which was the ritual, cleanse and assassinate versus Eldar, the rest of it was tactical, was you're thinking, okay, well, if I deploy here, I'm potentially going to get charged or maybe shot at this angle, and I'm, but I really need to have this unit here to be able to go out over here and do investigate signals, for an example... Um, so with the ghost kills, being able to go, well, actually I'll deploy X amount of range away because they've got movement 12, they can't advance and shoot. So if I stay 24.1 away, they can't shoot me. <laughs> cool. Well, what I'll do is I'll put this ghost skill here so that it can move 10 to get investigate signals mm. or engage in all fronts, or I'll have a ghost skill here that can easily fit the back of its base wholly within six inches of the center for air denial. And then obviously set up maybe in the other corner, so two ghost kills up here for investigate signals, investigate signals, and then investigate signals if you drew it. So mm. that's a six-point turn, and I think in our demonstration that we did, it was that that happened. We had setups, and then 
this never happened to the demonstration, but we both went investigate signals. Well, that was perfect. <laughs> so ghost kills will help you set up for success when it comes to secondaries. And I quite like that about them. And then obviously you can, once they've done that, you can then go into the bully role. And uh, yeah, phenomenal. I mean, you mentioned about the ghost kills, the hammerheads. I also think that it does bait out. You can bait out a heavy tank and give them the range to come out and then shoot a ghost kill. And then you just go blank, blank, blankety, blank, blank. Cool, stims, I'm not dead. And then the hammerhead goes, oof, mm. you're gone. You're out. So I like the bait and switch. Okay. Ghost kills, I think. And then, uh, and then talking about guns and things going bye bye, uh, cyclic versus fusion. What was your thinking there, uh, and was that an anticipation of the meta having more shots with a lower damage ceiling, or was it that you had because of the hammerheads you had your anti vehicle role covered, so you were just looking at because the cyclic is a very diverse gun. It's a marine killer. It's a terminator killer. Uh, and, you know, sending six shots into, like, a Drakari Scourge unit or something, it's still going to put in work. So was that was that roughly your estimation? Was there anything else in there? Yeah, I just... Um, I, I suppose the Cyclic versus the... Cyclic Iron Raker versus the Fusion Collider. I'll be honest, I've not played around with the Fusion Collider. My, mod my Ghost Kills aren't uh, modelled with both options, so I mm. need to do a bit of hobbying. But the main thing is, is that I don't like having units that have got a low range um, because it gives my opponent the ability to mitigate that. And I'm so used to players being like, okay, oh, so it's got a, you know, take fusions on a crisis, for example. It's got a 12-inch range and you move 18. Okay, so if I say 30.1, you can't shoot me. And they're going, yes. And then it's like little things like that. So the fusion collider also, for me, it kind of contradicts the loan op because you got to get within 18 to shoot and unless you're firing and fading that piece then you're then going to have incoming damage so i can see there being a need for one because then you could fire and fade that particular piece and keep it safe and just keep jumping in and out but then you really want to fire and fade with other stuff like riptides maybe so i think the cyclic iron rake is just an all comers mario of mario kart kind of thing it can do a little bit of everything it's not very, you know very good the two shots in the fusion collider yeah when it connects it's awesome but uh, I'm, i just can't get over that two shots part and i, I think mm. for me the six shots um and having him bully things like scout units forward deploying units marines or small little vehicles that I can just chip away so i think my anti-tank was covered with my hammerhead and long strike the rest of it was more of a combined arms approach so you are not going to kill that one thing because you're not the hero today but you combined with a riptide or breaches will do the work so everything was designed to work in conjunction with each other to get the kill not be a hero very nice very nice so let's move on to uh, what is star of the show, but sharing the spotlight, I guess. Let's talk about the rail guns because I mentioned before that you were researching in advance what is actually taking invulnerable saves at the moment. How did that research end up for you at the event? Did it turn out that there you know, was a, a shift that you didn't expect similar to your chaos uh, where you know, all of a sudden everybody's going, okay, cool, well, I've got Magnus, I've got, you know, just uh, these things that are sporting, you know, four ups. And I guess knights have the five up and that can still sometimes be annoying when you fire one shot and they absorb it on a five, because we all know that that happens at the worst possible moments. Uh, how did, how did your research pay off? Was, was the chaos worth it? The chaos was worth it. Um, obviously, like I said, I played guard round one and um, I was hunting tank commanders and I made the very uh, clever decision to, um strap reserve um my long long strike and hammerhead and i will give credit where credit's due and then me and the scene were staying with each other uh, at an accommodation for the event and we were rolling dice and he was like there's no way your sms does that damage and we just practiced everything and he was like all right yeah fair so we we're just rolling dice in a room rather than going out and getting pissed that's how sad we were but then he said like oh you're going against guard tomorrow i was like yeah and he was like you better strap reserve those lo lo those hammerheads, boy. And I was like, surely not. And I looked at the math and we did the math. I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, manticores, piss off. So if I'd have had my like hammerheads and long strike on the board, they would have died before they ever got like a line of sight on the tank commanders. So wow. I strap reserved them and it paid off. 
Mm. Um, because remember, Manticore's they've been hitting on twos, ruling ones, AP three. Every damage that goes through is like flat three. It oh, just, that's it, horrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Your hammerheads AP three with cover AP two five up saves, it, it's just obscene. So I start reserved them. So going against tanks like the tank commanders, easy. Bam, you're gone. Bam, you're gone. Really good. Um, then we move into some of the other vehicles. Like yes, I went up against Eldar. They had the Avatar, a four up inbun with fake dice, and then the Wave Serpent as well with inbuns. But I think the way that I tackled that was. Trying to bait out any kind of like CP. Um, so I hit him with a railgun. If you want, you can fake dice it, waste a fake dice to pass your invuln. Then you've got two seekers. So AP3, ignoring cover, still going to put them on a five up invuln. They might pass one, D6 plus one. But they're probably not going to because they're going to probably roll, maybe CP re roll. And that's a lot of resource that they're spending just to keep a wave serpent alive. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you do that, all right, you've stopped long strike. What about the other hammerhead that's now going to shoot you? Very rarely are hammerheads trying to get greedy and shoot two targets. Yeah. They'll just go in one and go, you're dead. Oh, you died anyway, and you spent a fate dice, you spent a CP for a reroll. I've just shot 270 points in a spotter unit. That's all I've done. Yep. So, yep. And then the avatar, really tanky boy. You know, four plus and vulnerable save, minus one to wound, half down, all that. I was like, okay, cool. Here's a screen. You can't get past that. Mm. Shooting you constantly with all the little shitty shots, the breaches, the grenade stratagem, the ghost kills. And I was like, what are you down to? He was like, oh, I went on to eight wound. I was like, all right, fair enough. You know what? I might as well. Ba boom! Your boy rolled a six to wound. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but half damage, not a problem. Down to a couple of wounds. Again, screening, stuff like that. So I think at first I was worried about the inbuns, but then I started to try and put a positive spin on it, which is, well, if they have an inbun, if they pass it, they pass it. You know, inbuns be fickle or they'd be brilliant. But if they don't, the best case scenario for me is I'm deleting their... CP usage and putting them under pressure and making them think about well I could pass my invun but what if I don't we're all very guilty of this it's like the what ifs and buts should I shan't should I should I stay should I go should I push it should I not ah oh, time shit clock go let forget it I'm not doing it and so many people were like actually no I'm not gonna do it I'm gonna be safe I'm there going excellent <laughs> <laughs> or when they went full send it i was like shit this better fucking connect <laughs> this better connect and perfect example was a space wolf player like round three um he had one dreadnought which was the beyond the fell handed whatever it's called oh yeah beyond yep Minus one dam, my half damage, feel five up, feel the pain. I was like, I'm ignoring that guy <laughs> on a tiny little base, a tiny little model. I was like, well, I ain't gonna see him anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. But the hammerheads in that one were like, okay, we've not really got optimal targets here, and that was a real sweat fest. Uh, the guy came third in the end. Um, but I got off on a bit of tangent, but that was the probably the one game where the hammerheads um, were just praying for a good target. And Longstrike got one good target. Um, the other Hammerhead was able to plink off a few doggos. Um, but I didn't go against um, anything... What was it? Round five? Yeah, so actually, speaking of which, in answer to your question, yeah, I killed tank commanders and stuff that didn't have invuns, but I was shooting against Doomstalkers, Catans, Avatars of Cain, Wave Serpent, Dread Knights. And tackling their invun, but then the games that it actually mattered, the guard, tank commander's dead. And then, spoiler alert, the Grey Knights at the end, it'd be a real shame if that land raider was just to disappear, <laughs> gone, right? and he even spent the armor of contempt thing to make give it a six oh, plus six. I was like, oh, if you insult me here and roll that six, I'm oh. going to be really salty. He didn't. <laughs> I don't oh. want to say that that has happened to me multiple times, but you know we won't we won't yeah. go into that. Yep. Yep. So like, it connected with targets that don't have an inbun, and it just decimated them. And uh, inbun, I just rolled the dice. 
and thought, yeah, if he passes in, he passes in, but if, I can't do anything about it, but let's still apply the pressure. So honestly, I think the Hammerhead's really, really good. Um, and if you are worried about the inbuns, then there are only 130 points. Let me repeat that. 130 points. <laughs> what the hell? So you can easily get Quad Hammerhead in a list for what? 270 for Long Strike uh, and one Hammerhead, 260. So what, 530, 530 points? 530, got yep. Four Hammerheads. <laughs> Just saying. Takes me back to ninth when I was one of the first people in my local meta to start running four hammerheads. And people just being like, oh, yeah, the rail gun's good, but blah, 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 but math hammer, but blah, 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 blah. And then a knight's play is done with his turn after my, I had one and a half turns and we called it. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and it's the sort of thing that, like, I... You know, when people were messaging me and being like, oh, I don't know about the, you know, you should take hammerheads, you should whatever. At that point in the matter, I was like, dude, you have no idea how much I want to put my boys on the table. You have no idea how much I want to put the unit that got me into Tau. You have no idea how much I want to put it on the table. And yeah. I'm hoping that the Australian meta will follow soon. Uh, and I think by the looks of the team's tournament, because I've got to do a full review of the list that we're winning and doing well and everything else, because when you're TOing, you don't have a lot of time to, after your initial list review, you're not paying attention during the day. It's more about the round going well and time and player behaviors and everything else. So once I review that, I'm really hoping that I start seeing very, very similar things where I can go, oh boys, let's get it. Because I would love to play with them again. And I think, you know, it was something I said at the start of our, our stream that there are some times where you just want to play something different, where you know something. So I, I stopped playing crisis suits before the nerf, not because I, I was worried about their performance or whatever else. I was saying to people, I know what they're going to do. There, there's no discovery here for me. I know what a six man is going to do to people. I want to yep. do something else. we got a pretty deep index. I want to have a look at what we're doing. And it'll probably hit the point after the codex comes out, once we solve the meta for the first time until it gets solved again and again and again, whatever, I'm probably going to start playing other shit because diversity is actually very, 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 very healthy, not just for the game, but for us as players. Because the community, if, you, if, you look at, if you look at the... Um... The, the same weekend that I went to Goonhammer, we had a very successful performance for Tau as a community. So we came at 56% um, and there was 28 Tau players and 32% of those went X and 1. And we had... Holy shit, uh, let's fucking go! Yeah, we had X and 1, but every list that did well was different. So we had um, a guy, um, he's going to kill me if I keep going. It's either Andrew Hobbs or James Hobbs came fourth <laughs> at um, UKTC uh, South Coast and he took six broadsides, no breacher fish, just broadsides, riptides, ghost. It was just savage, absolute savage. And he came fourth at one of the biggest UKTC events at the time down south coast it was that's phenomenal incredible performance. that's incredible well done uh got getting to the top four cuts and only losing to david gaylard who won the event like hats off man like really well done and then you've got myself we're talking about all, my list at goonhammer and then you had other events all around the, the world that these lists were all different in some way shape or form and that's probably come from these players going you know what i want to do my own thing i'm bored of running crisis suits or I want to try something different and it's worked because they've maybe anticipated the meta like I've talked about, looked at stuff, or they've just gone, fuck it, I'm taking this because I like these models and done really well because everyone's gone, wait, what? <laughs> so I think the impact of just being experimental but having conviction in an idea that you've got and going for it, absolutely should. Yeah, I, I early on, won a few events or had, you know, top 10 or top five placings at, at GTs. And I was like, all right, cool. I've, I know that I can do that with the strong stuff. And now there's a little part of me that's like, I want to make sure that if anybody talks about me as a towel player, they're not like, oh yeah, he just like abused crisis suits for, you know, eight months and then, you know, whatever. 
I want them to go, all right, we, like, we saw him on all this different stuff. And, like, if you go into Jay on Tau, that is a scary prospect. Not, oh, yeah, okay, if Jay's rocking crisis suits, he's going to blow you up because, of course, he fucking is. It's, you know, as soon as I moved on to the Pathfinder stuff and I was locking Custodes players and Imperial Guard players and everything else in their deployment zone, I went from doing it with Piranhas to doing it with Pathfinders and Kills and everything. And, I mean, I was using Kills before, but there's something that just hits different about a line of dudes like this long over the table. And, <laughs> and, and it's just, you know, and then people are looking at that just like, oh, I didn't know Tao had these tricks. And it's like, yeah, because if you're only playing people that are playing a castle delete everything unit, they're not applying pressure in a similar way. They're not ending the game in a similar way. And yeah, you might table me, dude, but I'm having the time of my fucking life here because I own three quarters of the board. And even if I'm dying, I don't care. You aren't going anywhere. And that's, and yep. that's you know, a different form of of fun, which is really, really cool. Like not a, it's fun to delete stuff. Don't get me wrong. It's why I fell in love with the hammerheads, but there is also something fun about running something diverse and beating people in a different way. And it's really, really cool that we're seeing people just go, Hey, fuck it. We are coming up to a codex. And I feel like this might've triggered a few things as well. Everybody knows that events leading up to the Codex, people are probably going to be experimental. They're probably just like, all right, these rules for all we know might go away. These points might shift greatly. We might get brand new, fresh stuff, and I want to use what we've got now. I want to have some fun and put it on the table. And I think that's cool too. Like, even if somebody doesn't have the solid reasoning and research that you had for putting hammerheads on the table or SMS or whatever else... It's cool that somebody's like, fuck it, this, this is my jam and it is going to go on the table. Because if that codex comes out and it is a dumpster fire, I might not see this model again for a year. Yeah, and I think uh, one thing I love is that the, the, the community backing that I've had on my Discord has been hilarious. I think one of the guys called Johnny uh, <laughs> did something funny. One guy asked a question which was like, do you think the list could be competitive in WTC or different formats? And then Johnny just put, this man could make two scoops of ice cream and 36 tactical drones competitive. Don't ask him. At the time, though, it was really funny. I was over my partner and I was actually eating ice cream. And I was like, okay, that's weird. Is he watching me? But no, <laughs> it was so funny. But you can make anything competitive within reason. Obviously, tactical drones is a joke. They're, they are a joke. Like, let's not even get on that topic. But the rest of the stuff, you can make it competitive if you think about how you're going to utilize the unit and you have a plan for it. Um, because points win games. So if that plan revolves around you scoring points in some weird and wonderful way, then hats off. I mean, um, one of the hobs, that the, the guy that did really well, he took three units of Vespid and then six broadsides and just clearly used his Vespid for scoring and just uppy downies mm. just kept doing it. So, you know, I don't take Vespid, and I've never have within 10th, but clearly it's doing well for him. So branch out, use them while you can, and then if the Codex has those particular choices that you've been taking your list to be really good, then you're going to be well-practiced with them rather than going, fuck, that's really good. How the hell do I use it? You're practicing now, because they're not going to have too much change to stuff. There'll be slight yeah. alterations with yeah. rules and things, but the concept of how they operate will most likely be broadly the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so before we move on to our next topic, uh, I do just want to do uh, a couple of shout outs uh, and also remind people the website link that you're seeing just below our cameras and also the one that is in the YouTube description is for the raffle where you can, as part of a massive first prize, win a free ticket to one of my events if you're within Australia or a massive coaching session or full game of 40k played against me on Tabletop Simulator. So go and check that out. It will be running for a week. So pick yourself up a ticket or multiple and get yourself in on that. There's a bunch of stuff for the second and third place as well. Uh, it's all in the description of the product. Uh, I do want to make uh, two quick shout outs. The first is to... Uh, a person that I've had a, a couple of conversations with, they messaged me on Messenger, uh, and I, I haven't gotten permission to use their name just yet, but I do want this person to know when they listen to this recording, they have received some 
uh, pretty terrible news, uh, some pretty terrible health-related news. Uh, and they were actually listening to uh, one of my videos, to me and Kyle talking together, uh, and just wanted to let that person know, mate, we're thinking of you. Uh, we, I've messaged him, Kyle. We're going to have a little bit of a, you know, a Q and A that he can throw in some of his questions. We really, really hope that there is a speedy recovery that you start feeling better and, uh, all the best mate, because receiving terrible health news is heartbreaking. Um, all the best mate. The, uh, the second one, the second one is to, uh, a, a uh, patron of mine called, uh, he's changed his name, pre his Discord name to Stormcrow because there's a really, really cool story behind that. I won't step on it. I'll let my patrons sort of find that one out. Uh, but Kyle, I've been doing a little bit of like community fundraising to try and get some of these croup boxes. I am not a person that's generally had a lot of money. So wanting to make content getting, you know, as much as I could onto the table and potentially running pure croup and all that sort of stuff was a nice prospect. Uh, I had this guy, he is US uh, defense, so similar background to me, but obviously different country, uh, served overseas in Iraq, uh, and he has uh, he has bought me two boxes with the proviso that they're painted by me, uh, and then I send him in six months to a year a full box back, but I will have six months to a year to make content on that. I want to say a massive shout out to him. I don't think I would have been looking at the number that I'm getting if it wasn't for him. So please, everybody in chat on Twitch, hit him with the rail gun emote. Uh, show Stormcrow some love. Dude, you're absolutely amazing. Uh, I will double check whether I have permission to use his name because I don't want to just advertise that on the internet without his permission. Uh, but yeah, really, really, really fucking incredible. I'm kind of taken aback and humbled by that shit so uh yeah that's that's our shout outs that's our plugs for the raffle don't forget about it but let's uh let's go on to kyle if you could walk me through round by round you've mentioned a couple of your matchups but if you could give us your uh your biggest concern for the matchup running the sms and the rail guns and the list that you built around it uh and maybe some deployment considerations cuz this is something i think i get asked a lot for all right i've got this the, the hammerhead and somehow my opponent keeps finding it and blowing it up before i'm ready now i have a few thoughts on this but i'd like to see if your brain goes to a similar place how you deploy position or reserve your hammerheads in each of these matchups knowing what you're going into and maybe what your major concern is okay so everybody looks for a bit of inspiration with the deployment. It's a very um, popular topic. And usually I'm very kind of like, okay, guys, well, talk me through this, talk me through that. And then and I, I kind of give them the advice and like, have you all to do deployment here? But I'm going to do something slightly different. And I'm going to be a little bit brutal. Um, plan your deployment with the terrain pack. You should know when you get to that table, if you can deploy your shit without it being shot. If you can't, and you deployed your shit, and it got blown up, it's your own fault. It's brutal, but fair. So, what did I do to plan my deployment? What I did is I looked at the, the map, okay? And you can sometimes recreate the maps on TTS. Uh, the Goonhammer one wasn't available on TTS, so I made it. I made oh, right. the GW one. I'm not very good with technology. I didn't make it and create all the files. I just basically... Oh, you're a load. hack. Get out of here. Wait, you're a hack. Wait, wait. <laughs> I loaded up the GW one and unlocked the terrain and then basically positioned it with the measurements. That's not difficult to do. Very nice. And then I just set up the deployment line and went, okay, what can I hide here? Yep, I can hide everything. Cool. Then I can deploy everything quite safely but then it's all there and i don't want it all to be here i want it to be spread out so i thought where can i position my delfish with the scout move because i put the pathfinders in it dark strider goes in the other one can it get to a piece of terrain without being shot okay so it can't get shot by this angle but it could be shot down here is that a risk that i'm willing to take do you know what for board control yes it is because if they come out and shoot a devilfish, my hammerheads get to shoot them so they're not going to do that so I'm thinking about all those possibilities there. But I'm planning the deployment. And then if I can't 
hide any kind of stuff, or maybe there's indirect, like the guard, I will put stuff into strategic reserve. So I know that, for example, if I wanted to do three hammerhead list with pathfinders as well, I can put three hammerheads, well, two hammerheads on long strike and a pathfinder team in strategic reserve within the four, uh, 500 point limit. So thinking about that and knowing the army that you're going against, influences your strat reserve plan so i don't struggle with deployment because it's one re repetition two understanding the tournament pack and pre-planning my deployment even to a point where i have folders stuff that i prepared when i went to the lvo of all of the packs the the different terrain layouts the whole lot so i do put in the work and what it actually does is it gives you a really good sense of confidence when you're going in rather than going to the table and going, fuck, how do I deploy? Uh, uh, oh, I'm on a clock. Um, okay, my opponent's asking me questions. Uh, I, I gotta, where are my dice? Where's my tape measure? Where, where, you, you're flustered and you'll make a mistake. But if you go in there going, right, set up stall, dice, tape measure, um, aids of some sort of stuff like little templates and stuff, and then I know what my deployment is, then makes it smoother and how many times and just think to yourself and ask yourself this one question have you ever gone to a game where someone's turned around to you and they've got the head down and be like oh you just deploy your shit mate and I'm, I'm just going to keep deploying <laughs> because they already know how they're going to deploy and you're there going what huh it's because they've planned and they know where stuff goes where they can get the firing angles so on and so forth so it's not a disrespect to you. Like, I don't care about you, bro. You're just a fly on the wing shield. Like, they're like... I just well, unfortunately, back. sometimes that is the case. But, you know, we, it, not everybody. Not, not everybody. They just have the plan that they've prepped for weeks and they know where they're going to deploy because they know the firing angles and they know where the units want to be or can get to because they've planned it. And that's the same with deployment. Just practice at home, set up your terrain sets, you can use TTS if you don't have the terrain set physically, or if you've got the terrain set physically, go and practice. Put in like a couple of like no, 10, 15 minutes just to practice it. It doesn't take much, but it'll give you that confidence going into the game. Um, if you're asking for any particular words of wisdom of what units go where, I can't really give you that because it all depends on your list and what you're going against. But as a way concept, too contextual, yeah. As a, as a context, oh sorry, a concept, I'd say that. Well, if you imagine on most games, there is maybe two firing lanes down the flanks, maybe a cheeky one down the center, then maybe think about having your anti-tank on both the flanks so you're covering the firing angles to stop somebody swirling around one side. If you have fast-moving units that can jump everywhere, yeah, crisis suits are pretty quick with the 18 I mean, maybe have them centrally, especially on the GW uh, layouts. And maybe the breacher fish, you can have them supporting the flanks to be able to push out to an objective, deny. So you've got to think about all of these little things. And then you can kind of just have a basic game plan. Um, cover the firing ends on the, on the flanks. Be able to have my fast moving units go from the central so they can react. Little things like that. And those are basics and fundamentals. But in terms of matchup dependent and army list, well, that's the whole fun of 40k. Figuring out and getting yourself like an archive of... I won't do that again, or that worked, I'll do that again. So learn by doing. Yeah, and one, one thing I want to throw onto that, because that's all very, very, very good advice. Uh, one thing that I don't know if you do this as well, but I start. I picked this up very, very early on. When there are certain pieces in my opponent's army, and this is where, as we were saying, context is so important. There is no blanket answer for deployment. Uh, I Do you find that you alter the order in which you put stuff down? Like, for example, if I've got somebody that's like, oh, cool, I'm running a Stormlord, dude. Uh, I'm like, cool. Not a single hammerhead will go down until I know where that fucking model is placed. When I know what side of the board you're on, what areas you can drive through or buildings that are blocking you or whatever else, not a hammerhead will be touched down. If I walk up to my opponent and they're like, okay, cool. Uh, how many infiltrators do you have? They're like, oh, I don't have any. How many scout moves do you have? Oh, I don't have any. Oh, ho, 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 ho. okay. So my ghost kills, my pathfinders, I won't actually place down until I see where his forward guys are. Because we were talking about before with ghost kills, you're like, all right, if I measure out, you know, 24 inches with your move and your shoot and whatever else to be able to get within 12, if he hasn't put anything in a position where I'm like, I could put a ghost kill there. And I'm like, and he hasn't put anybody that's close or he's put like a guardsman unit with some las guns. 
I will go, cool, bang, here is my ghost kill right there. You haven't placed anything that can threaten him, so I'm more than happy to be aggressive. And if I get first turn, that ghost kill is running at your guardsman, tank shocking you after shooting you, and stopping you from leaving. And so I, is that something that you find yourself doing similarly, where there's, you know, on top of that plan... You've also got this cascading order of threat based on the army you're going into, which again, isn't really trainable for somebody until they start thinking in that order because it has to be based on your opponent's list. Do you find yourself doing that when you're setting up and watching your opponent do their thing or are you a, I will deploy because of my plan sort of person? Um, I'm a bit of both, but um, I think you've kind of answered the question with your explanation i do also do the same thing like mm. um well take the gray knight game i kept long strike and hammerhead um till last um because i want to see where the land raider goes i'd already kind of pre-planned out if he goes here i can shoot him from this angle and if he deploys over here i can deploy my hammerhead and long strike over here to get firing angles down there and I'd already taken that one step further by, in my deployment phase, I just looked at um, where he could deploy, and I spotted that there was like a line of sight down the middle. Kind of hard to see on stream, but I do use a laser line. But I'd put a dice where my hammerheads had to finish to be able to get that line of sight. Ah, oh, very good. Raider. So I'd kind of like playing 5D chess, where I'd placed a dice there and he hadn't placed the land raider there, but I placed a dice there knowing that if he did place it there, I could get to there and shoot. And then as soon as he placed that land raider, I was like, good. Bam, bam. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Interlocking hammerheads, done. And then goodbye land raider. So that's the kind of forward planning that I do when it comes to deployment. It's not just about mine, it's about where my opponent can be or could deploy. And then in terms of the infiltration and scout war, if they have zero of that, I can actually play games within a game and mini game within the game. And I can just be like, okay, so I could actually place this ghost kill here to bait you out, to bring all your damage in the guns, because mm. you might see it as an error, but actually it's part of the plan where you'll go and kill a ghost kill, you kill the ghost kill, well done, and now delete that entire flank of yours, thank you very much. And they're like, oh, it wasn't a mistake. I was like, no, it's deliberate. But when other people have scout moves, infiltrating moves, you have to then do the battle of wits of like where they're going to protect them. Are they going to place it to stop me from advancing to them or are they going to place it defensively? And then if they place it defensive on one side, I have to then focus on this side. So it's predetermined the swirl. You're going to go that way. I'm going to go that way. But if they then do it centrally, it's like, OK, well, I've got options. And do I want to attack both flanks or do I just want to concentrate over on one side? Or do I just want to go and snowball the middle? Mm. So I like that kind of infiltration scout war. But when people don't have it, yeah, like you said, you can proper take advantage of that and go, if you don't go first, buddy, I'm going to run my ghost skills and my pathfinders in your face. Um, and if you go second, you're like, oh, well, I'm set up defensively anyway. So I'm not going to lose anything because my pathfinders can jump back into Delphi, that kind of jazz. So I, um, I do have a fixed deployment uh, in my head. But then when I get to the table, I adjust it depending on what I'm going against. And those examples that we just talked about are a perfect um, example of, of what you would do to change. If they don't have infiltration scout, you can yeah. just infiltration war. And, and I feel like you have to play 5D chess when you're wanting to beat the best players because you know for a fact they're doing it to you. You know for a fact that they're looking at the exact same thing but with their tools. And if you're not playing that, there is, if you're not playing the same game as somebody, 5D chess or, you know, the thing from uh, Mission Impossible where they're fucking, wh whatever, you know, if, if you're not doing that, you're not participating in the same game that they are. And so... I just <laughs> love, I just, I was just like, laughing because with what you said then, it just, re <laughs> I love playing against someone where, you know that meme from um, um, Mad Max? Uh, where he's just like, yeah, that's a bait. Yeah. Bait. 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 And when you're playing a similar player, and then they're like, okay, so you've set up that ghost skill there, you've put it within the enough range for to shoot, but that's a, that's a trap. I'm not going to go for that. And I'm there going, e And they're like, I got you. And I'm there going, oh, you placed that unit there. That's definitely bait, that is. You set it up. So I'm, like, oh, I'm not going to do that. And you end up with this weird interaction where for like two turns, you're both there going, uh, uh, uh. Uh, and then one of you goes, fuck it. 
send. Yeah, <laughs> you're like, yeah. Oh, let's go. It's those interactions, and because your understanding of the obviously what you're doing, and you start to cut on the tricks, it's so exciting. It's so funny. Mm. <laughs> And it, and it's really sort of like a progression of you learn to play 40K, but then you start hitting the top tables and then you learn to play the 40K within 40K. Yeah. And it's almost like, you know, if somebody never delves deep into the tournament scene, you never learn this second game within the game. Mm. And it's, it's actually really fun and exciting. Now, from what you were saying, uh, this is why I think it'd be really great to run through your matchups because there was stuff that was you could see in your brain while you were talking. There was stuff that jogged in your memory for decision-making points. And I'd love to have some people crawl into your brain in a, you know, a figurative sense, not a weird thing. Uh, so let, let's go through your round one. You had your Astro Militarum. Aside from hunting tank commanders, which I hope you were patient, by the way. Uh, uh, um... Was there anything else in that matchup aside from, okay, I threat reserve against the Manticores. Was there anything else that was causing you any major decision-making points? Or was it once you covered those bases, all right, cool, this is the Astra Militarum matchup? Um, uh, Josh, Joshua Wood, really, really funny guy. We played each other before. Um, we had a right laugh. And it turns out I can kind of whittle down Cassacrine and I can kill tank commanders, but five Rattlings, five Hobbit dudes with sniper rifles, apparently I can't fucking kill. Um, those guys denied me a fair few points just because he kept rolling five up saves. I handed him something like 16 saves to make and he passed like 14, 15 of them over three turns. I was like, these goddamn hobbits, man! God damn it! And my ghost kill going, because I went second, was in the perfect position to, ah, oh, well, there's, there's three rattlings on an objective and one cassacrin. So you can make your cassacrin OC two, so that's two, so there's five OC on there. So as long as I kill, I think he only had two or one rattling, I can't remember, but I was like, as long as I kill three of those rattlings, I can take the objective from you and get my tempting target, and the maximum you'll see you could put on there is three, so I would take you off the primary. Rattlings went, fuck you. <laughs> and I was like going, what? <laughs> he was like, oh man, these rattlings, I expected them to die, and then obviously the excitement, and I couldn't kill them. So... Apart mm. from that, everything else went to plan, but these rattlings were like, nah, we ain't dying. Now, I have to ask the question because it came up in our last stream. As a self-proclaimed angry dwarf yourself, was a little party, like, proud of your cousins? I, I literally just turned around to the guy. I was like, he was like, you're really angry about them not dying. I was like, yeah, and he was like, you're not going to punch me. I was like, no, that's fist bump. Well done. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And I think at one point I just left them alone until finally my commander turned around and went. <laughs> as they them. as they do, yep. It was just like, but I'm using a fucking commander to kill some hobbits. Brilliant. Sometimes <laughs> so, chassos have to punch down, you know. It... <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Um, the guard matchup pretty much went as planned. Um, the the rail guns into the tank commanders. I got quite lucky. Um, because when I shot one of the rail guns at him, um, I killed the tank commander and then he rolled a one to shoot on death. And I was like going, oh, that's, okay. oh, so he, he, had, he had a potential chance. It's not statistically going to always kill a hammerhead, but I was expecting to lose the hammerhead that shot him. So hammerhead kills tank commander, tank commander kills hammerhead done. I, I, I feel like that's worth in terms of the matchup that you were walking into. That is a trade that I would make every single fucking day. Yeah. 130 mm -hmm. points, and I'm pretty sure a tank commander's not 130 points. So I would I'm... hazard a guess, yeah. Yeah. So I was expecting that, but I got quite lucky, and everything else was just pressurizing his infantry pieces, whittling them down to a low number so that they couldn't use the 2CP strap to bring them back. And uh, then when they're yeah. below half strength and they have to take battle shock test, the moment they fail battle shock test, I kill them because they can't use the stratagem on them. So yes. it's laying that laying that down as a groundwork have been like wait for them to fail battle shot then go in for the kill um but obviously he was able to get a few units back because at some point i had to kill them and it got him a few extra points on homers so the game was i believe in terms of the i'll load up the scoring now but i think it was a uh, hundred to sixty one yeah um, actually while but... you look that up for anybody who's wondering about that particular interaction i believe it got clarified in the rules commentary even though you know uh, a unit that's battle shot can't be targeted with a stratagem they they clarified so this is any event gw WTC, ITC, doesn't matter. 
uh, that a unit that dies while battle shocked is still considered under the effects of that battle shock when you're wanting to target things like um, you know, fight on death stratagems or uh, resurrection or whatever else. It all follows them into death because technically speaking, when you reinforce, that is a new unit. Uh, and the old unit was, you know, it was battle shocked up until the point it left the table. It leaves the table battle shocked. So, uh, yeah, for anybody who needs to find that for their opponent or look it up or whatever else, that's what's Kyle. That sorry, that is what Kyle is talking about, and that's what caused that decision making. I think it was another thing as well. It's like uh, I always have. It was. It was a. <laughs> It was a heated topic of does it, don't it? And I think if you apply logic, remaining effects on units. So even like I was talking with Nassim, who's a guard player, he was just like, yeah, I wouldn't do it anyway. I'd just be like, yeah, it's dead, it's done. Battle shot, cool. Um, so yeah, that game ended uh, 100 to 66. Um, really good player. We had a right good laugh. Um, but I think it came down to um, those tank commanders going down and getting the board control. And I went second as well, so... He definitely did damage with the indirect, but I knew that he could kill the hammerheads. Um, and outside of that, he could potentially down a riptide, but it's swingy with stim injectors. So he went for my mobility, went for the devilfish and killed the devilfish a turn. So I could never get to his indirect because of the way that the terrain was. It's literally like... Oh, yeah, here, and they just here, park here, him inside. and Yep, yep, been so there. I only got to that later stages of the game when he was capturing the outpost, that kind of stuff when he had nothing left. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, folks on the midboard win that game. The next one was against Eldar, uh, a lovely lady called Liz. She had taken, um, a, I wouldn't say a hugely different build, but it definitely had a bit of experimentation in there. So okay. still had the card, um, but it had a unit of five um, and the spirits here to go into a wave serpent. Um, and then obviously yeah, it still had the characters like um, he had a Farseer in a unit of Guardians, um, had um, the Death Jester, had Avatar, um, it had Skyrunner, Fugan, lo lots of characters basically. And then it had Fire Dragons, um, big unit of six bikes, the jet bikes. Um, yep. So for that mass shots and ignoring cover and things Yeah, like isn't that. it a lot? Yeah, you look lot, at how right? good everything else yeah. must have been when that unit exists and wasn't being mm -hmm. taken. Yeah, so War Walkers as well, really point efficient and just annoying. Um, and then like spiders and, and all the other mission play stuff. So that game, I kind of went into it going, all right, well, Hammerheads, you need to take away the Wave Serpent and threaten the Avatar and other units. That was their targets. And just SMS anything that's got ears. Okay, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Anything that's got point ears, get rid of it. And the glory of watching my sms just kill four fire dragons oh you've got the fire pike left cool <laughs> i'll have one save to make on a four pins one rip tide yeah yeah yeah, yeah. if i was to pass it oh i failed it the eyes light up now nah, cp roll passed <laughs> done um and then the characters so that game i knew that eldar want to use their aggressive characters way leaper Hugan, um, so killing that wave serpent turn one and then damaging the wraith guard down to like one model it had like one wound left but I left it alive because I wanted to see well if I get assassinate not assassinate if I get um, because I was going fixed I was like I'll get the assassinate point anyway uh, but I want to prioritize in killing Fugan once so I kill Fugan once to then go well next turn when he does die he's dead dead mm. and then that's what happens so I allowed them to bring a Wraith Guard back, knowing that I'd get a couple of shots, but two Wraith Guard shots on an invun, I can take that. Might not connect with them all. With the rerolls and stuff, probably will, but then I've got invuns, and fine, I'll take that. So the decision was assassinate and cleanse because we're playing on the ritual, um, and I just took out those pieces, and then once the Fire Dragons were dealt with, Fugan um, had this glorious moment where... Fugan had basically doubled down to try and kill a Riptide with a Wayleaper. And I got me down to something like four wounds and then went into the charge. And I just went, stims. And basically, I survived and then shot Fugan in the face, killed him dead. And then the other Riptide had basically um, charged the Wayleaper, 
tank shocked him, and then between the two riptides, just kicked him to death. <laughs> so he lost the way leaper in combat. Excellent. Excellent. And then that was game, set, match. And the avatar was just slowed down and then grenade strat. And there was this glorious moment where breaches were screening the, um, uh, the avatar from just getting into my DZ. Sent to the board on the objective. He spotted an opportunity in the turn when he was going for the Fugan and um, Wayleaper uh, double down attack on the Riptide. Jumped out the Death Jester to get angles to do his thing with the extra sixes and the shots and stuff like that. And my breaches went, hang on a minute. Overwatch. We don't want any of that. <laughs> turn, turn three, just here's 13 saves to make on a Death Jester. And then Liz's face was like, oh. She rolled all the 13 dice and just died to the wounds. She kind of bossed it with her saves, but not enough. Okay. All right. <laughs> and then then died. And it was like, she was like, oh, man. <laughs> lost the Death Jester without even doing anything. I was like, breaches, well done. And then the breaches died from the Avatar. <laughs> naturally. Naturally. But, but they'd done their thing, right? They were like, mm. okay, cool. There's four points of Assassinate. Sweet. That game was a um, solid win. Um, I got um, 95 to 71. Um, then we move on to the spicy round. Oh, so- now, can I, before you get into the spice, can I say massive shout out to Liz and any of the, and I don't know if you've noticed in the UK, there are so many more females joining the hobby uh, or yep. just people that I would class as other, you know, the LGBTQI, trans, all, all that sort of stuff. We are seeing more of them coming to events and it is so great to see because we had a bunch of them at my team's event and I just find that when you have all different kinds of people that are coming to these events feeling comfortable to come out and do something that they love I just I I think it's really healthy for our scene so shout out to them and if you're watching this and you haven't delved into a tournament scene there hasn't been a better time to I made some of the best friendships that I have had and you are seeing a shift towards a lot of sportsmanship and, you know, no more of the gatekeeping crap that you hear about from the 80s and the 90s and everything else. Seriously, get involved with your tournament community. It's so good to see our sausage fest turning into just a fest. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I, I did make an effort with Liz, LGBT uh, community. Sorry, I shouldn't be smoking on stream, but anyway. And I, I, was, I was like, okay. Um, I, <laughs> I was, I'm constantly hyperactive, like, yeah, dude. And I was just making an effort as well just mm. to not go with those, you know, dude and stuff. So I, I really appreciated me and Liz just playing a really good game and just welcome like everybody in the community. We need more females. We need more people just not being, like I said, a sausage fest. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, man. I mean, you hit the nail on the head, but yeah. Um, <laughs> That game was really, really good, and um, Liz was actually uh, friends with Josh. And oh right, I yeah. Josh, and then straight into Liz, she's like, "Oh god damn it!" So did Josh walk over and go, "You're about to get bullied"? <laughs> pretty, much, pretty, pretty much, pretty much, yeah. Um, so the spice. Yeah, the let's do it. Three. Round three. So at the same time as I'm like um, absolutely destroying pointy elves, Nassim is playing with his guard against Space Wolves, and I will send you some of the memes after. Oh, but please there's do. so many memes, so many memes of this game. And I got turned up to this table, and this guy, um, really tall, is like Goliath, and I'm there going, hi. I was like, okay. hang on a minute. Weren't you just playing the scene? He went really calmly, collectively. He was like, yep. And I went, uh... Oh, did you beat him? And he went, yep. And I was like, <laughs> my arch rival that I was expecting to play had just been KO'd. Like, KO'd. There was. What a giga shad. Who let the dogs out? It, like, the scene was like, bro, I had like wolves in my deployment zone. What is a man to do? <laughs> <laughs> like, they were everywhere. And I was like, oh shit. And he was like, yeah, man. And then I was like, okay, cool. Talk me through your list. And I was, honestly, I was like petrified, terrified. I was like, shit, he's taking out Nassim. Yep. I, I've got to be on my game. And there's nothing more frightening than a Space Wolf player that has composure and control, not just mm. unga bunga, let's go. And he goes first. He goes, okay. Mm. Takes, bring it down. And uh, Homer's, and he goes, okay. Hmm. <laughs> 
Maybe this, I'll just roll this advance. Oh, I got a six. Yeah, I'll just send in assault assessors to tie up a devilfish 18 inches because the whole army is basically. I'm going to probably butcher his list, but it's got loads of characters on um, Thunderwolves. He's got two Thunderwolf units. One of them can rapid ingress turn one because of the interaction that allows him to. Mm. And then he's got um, the Logan Grimnar on foot, right? Just to give his entire army, I think, it re roll charges and advance rolls, I think, but it's definitely re roll charges. Then he's got the um, Dreadnought um, character. He's got um, Infiltrators, Scout units, three units of Wolfen, two big units of Wolf Packs, the Thunderwolf Cavalry. Um, he's got um, three units of intercess Assault Intercessors, just loads of stuff. And I was like, okay, this is a problem. And he gets into position, keeps his Thunderwolf Cavalry calmly in his deployment zone. And they're going, oh. They can auto advance. They get plus into and go 19 inches plus a charge plus re rolls. And he's also got six plasma interceptors and three plasma interceptors as well, which is crucial to the way he used the list. Mm. And what he basically does is he sets up that, sends one unit, sends his scouts, does homers, and done. And I'm going, okay, cool. And I notice a problem. If I don't push out my screens, he's just going to go rapid ingress. Here's another Thunderwolf cavalry, and then the other one and go full send. That I cannot happen. I cannot have happened. So I screened out, and then he just, excuse the pun, dogpiles my entire flank and just goes right, click, full send. For goes doing homers and just goes, nah, in. And I'm there going, oh shit. <laughs> I was like, fuck. But the problem is, he's got multiple reactive moves. He's mm. got a stratagem. If you get within nine, he can move away. D6. But then he's got the reactive moves after you shoot the unit with the character in the Thunderwolf Cavalry. So when you do your first activation, he then goes, okay, cool. I'm going to move D6 inches. And that can go in engagement range. There's so a couple of those cropping be... up. How good is it? Oh, man. You cannot basically be within seven. You have to be 7.1 away from the unit which causes issues when you're trying to get multiple firing angles on this unit because if you're 7.1 away and you shoot it, he goes, okay, well, now I'm going to hide behind the train so nothing else can shoot me. I'm like, yeah. and then he's just got all these plasma interceptors dropping down and they're going, oh, my God, I'm going to have to deal with all of that. And I've got wolves in it. Oh, my God. So I, I was like, I lost a couple of assets. I lost a Riptide, a Ghost Kill, Devilfish, Pathfinders. Um, I was seriously hemmed in. And I decided just to pull back, retreat away and fend them off. And then on the other flank, where it wasn't so strong, I pushed up with a few things. Um, and the game, I was honestly at this point when I saw that impact of his movement, um, very clever positioning, very clever kind of plan that he set. And I was like, I think I've lost this game. I was like, I can't, I need to spot an opportunity to get out of this. Good old capturing outpost comes in and they're going... Right, let's have a look at this. Move breaches six. He's got three infiltrators out of five infiltrators on his home field. Fuck it. I'm sick of being charged. I'm going to do the charging. <laughs> so I moved the breaches six inches. We're going to went for a nine inch charge with a CP reroll. Failed the first time and your boy got it on the second roll. Yay, and let's go. Eight points and I lost six breaches to combat. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still had four on the objective, which is OC8, and took him from it. So that got me eight points and then denied him five points. And we worked it out at the end of the game that if I hadn't have got that, I'd have lost by one point. Oh. So that was huge. Okay. Huge. A couple of glory moments is that you imagine the wolves are full on in. I've killed all the plasma interceptors. Wolves are up here engaged in combat with a hammerhead. The other ones are pushing firmly into my deployment zone. So I screen Shadow Sun in the corner of the board. In the corner of the board. I riptide there. Long strike here. Shadow Sun in the corner. And I just went, right, let's go. Bam, 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 bam. All the wolves are dead. Two characters alive. Shadow Sun pulls out a fusions and just goes, <laughs> kills both the characters. And they go, yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. <laughs> kill them. So fending them off, but pulling back like completely away. So that game was a nail biter, and it ended uh, on the scoring. And we, I accidentally forgot off some points. So on, I think on the actual scoring um, on the BCP, it says ninety-four to eighty-four, but it should have been a hundred to eighty-four. But that is not a reflection on me just 
beating the opponent. I won it because of catcher on the outpost and the 13-point swing. It yep. was the only thing that got me back in that game. Otherwise, he'd have won by one point. So that, honestly, I was sweating, and it came down to the wire. Both of us were like on like 56 seconds, like not even that. We were both just like, my God, this has been sweaty. Um, figuring out the reactive moves, it really put me under pressure, and I honestly made a few errors um, because of the pressure. Um, but my God, that was a difficult matchup. So hats off to the guy. And we talked to him afterwards. I was like, my God, me and Nassim did not like plan for He's like, you can't plan for Space Wolves because we're shit. And, like, <laughs> and, if, and if you plan for beating Space Wolves, your list will be worse into other stuff. So it's a perfect opportunity for me to go, ow! <laughs> best position um, in the meta to be in you shit no yeah. one's playing for you nobody's looking at you but if you know your stuff you will take people <laughs> and he took fucking uh, nasim for chain i know and then obviously we weren't trying nasim is an absolute lad man and i know obviously the memes were strong but there's this one where it's like king kong and godzilla fighting and it's like nasim's list is like um god uh, godzilla Kyle's towel list is King Kong. And then the doggo with the baseball bat comes up and then me and the Godzilla are running away. Like, no! <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. And it's like, yo, Nasim, did you lose? He's like, yeah, what two? And he's like, big dog. <laughs> so, so that was that send was send them through when you can. That's funny. I will. Yes. I will. I'm going to send you all. They're an absolute crack. They're oh. fucking amazing. So, yeah, that was um, very, very, very close. And then I went into the next day, and um, it was against um, Necron's um, Joshua Roberts. Mm. And his list is crazy good. Um, And I think Necron players can take um, a leaf out of Josh Roberts' book because Tau players are obsessed with crisis suits because they're cool. They, They are obviously put the fear of God into people. Necron players, they love Catans. They put the fear of God in people. Zero Catans. Oi. Zero. I don't... No uh, we had nothing but Necrons at my event just gone. They mm. dominated. I think there was one team who didn't have a Necrons player out of 16. Yeah. And all of them had Catans. I don't know that I've seen a list without them. So, let me tell you. The list is designed perfectly. It's got your triple wraiths and your Technomancers got plasmancers, not chronomancers, plasmancers, okay, in the um, immortal. So he's got a unit of uh, 10 and two units of 5. He's got two Doomstalkers. He's got two Scarab units. And he's got these Forge World units. Called, I think they're called the Anthropites uh, or, or something like that. They're basically a three-model Kineptic unit with two wounds each, T5, three up save, right? They're action monkeys. Now, um... What else is in the list? Uh, Luminous Aeris, and that's pretty much the rest of the list. Now, on paper, you think, that's not got... It's got some Doomstalkers, got some Immortals. The damage isn't that good. The Doomstalkers can do a bit of fair work, but it's not got a lot of shooting on paper. Let me tell you, the amount of mortal wounds that they can do to you is enough to down a Riptide. Because the Plasmancer have a ranged, well, an attack that's 18 inches that can forgo all loan up and stuff like that. It just does mortals to you. So on average, they can do, I think, two mortal wounds per Plasmancer. So if they dogpile one unit, they can do six mortal wounds. Then the Wraiths have the move over you and they do mortal wounds. So in the unit, six dice, seven dice, whatever it may be, they might get four mortal wounds. So they can absolutely just go, I want a mortal wound that off the board, done. And then obviously the reactive moves, you get within nine, they move uh, away. Um, if you're outside of 12, they can loan up the unit. Luminal Zeris is a loan up when he's within three of the unit. And Josh has designed the list so you might expect um, him to loan up race, and obviously he will do um, if he needs to. But if it's indirect, He'll just loan up the unit of three kinetic um, things from the Forge World stuff just to keep primary. 
So his list is designed around, I'm going to do all the secondaries and tactical because I can be everywhere. I'm also going to bully you with 18 race. And then I've got these dedicated anti-tank pieces that can also be loaned up so they can go out, shoot, and then loan up and not get shot back. He's then got the Lunozarius to be a beat stick. And what he did in this game was so smart, and I'm hoping other Necron players don't cut on to this, so part of me is like, don't say it on stream. <laughs> I'm, going to I'm a nice yeah, guy. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Here's an objective. Cool. He puts all the race around the objective, not touching the objective, and puts Lunozarius on the objective, so I can't get to the objective, and then goes, oh, your breaches. Ah, they don't do the real wounds anymore. And they're going, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> don't it, Josh. Don't it. <laughs> that is so good. And I won't lie, it makes me hate Necrons more. Yep. And then the other thing as well, and he did tell me about this, but I, I fell for it um, I was like later on in the stage of the game. I moved my breaches out and I was like, okay, so I've mapped out where you can um, move away if I get within nine. I'm going to move within range of you two because I'm always going to get shooting. And he went, yeah, okay. I left my breaches within... Well, five, 4.9 inches. So what he did is he reacted, moved, and just went, okay, I'm going to go over you and then go back in front of you. And he just killed, like, four breaches. And I was like, oh, man, why did I fall for that? So basically, not only was he not touching the objective, he just reacted, moved, and did mortals to me. And I was like, oh, I should have been, I should have done that. Mm. So my efficiency went way low as well. So it was just, like, very, very clever plays. Um, and to be honest with you, the last couple of turns we just talked out because... There was no win. I couldn't spot anything. And he was like, yeah. I had a couple of really golden moments, like long strike, just fucking nailing three wraiths. Uh, sustain hits two. Just like, get dead, get dead, get dead. Oh, and then boy. The other, and then the other hand ahead, turning around and being like, oh, I might join you, mate. Swiveled round, killed the other two because there was only five and the Technomancer. And then my breaches went, well, I'll kill the Technomancer. Sweet. Like, that, 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 that shouldn't have happened. I was like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. But Excellent. yeah, that game... Um, Proper goods, um, generalship shown by Josh. Understanding the 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 power of Tau and being able to combat it through the little things like the objective play, um, loan up play, and the SMS stuff and mm. loan up in things. And he actually Josh went on to then go and play Nassim in round five and beat Nassim. And the reason he beat Nassim was because he was loan up in those little small units to stop his indirect from taking. Ah, the of course, so, yeah, of course. So, Little things like that, very good decision. And the guy was a machine. He out of six hundred battle points, he scored five hundred and eighty-five. He only wow. dropped fifteen points, and the only person to deny him a hundred was Nassim. <laughs> so, okay, I mean, come on, like beautiful list and massive, massive hats off to him. He deserved to win the tournament. So good list, and he's in control of the uh, uh, GW balance data slate. So Josh. Fix your list. <laughs> it's brutal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what round did he end up going into Nassim? Because obviously at that point, on the next start of the next round, he would have been undefeated where Nassim still had a loss under his belt. Was that in yeah. the final round that he went into Nassim? Round five. Round five. It was round five. Yeah. Yep. So I think they, uh, Nassim had paired up. Um, so because there, there is ov obviously a chance you can get there if you have things like draws or just weird uh, matchups yeah. where people that shouldn't lose lose. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, interesting. Okay, well, hats off to that. It makes me feel dirty and sick saying that about Necrons. But um, mm. uh, after the stream, full disclosure, I will go and cry in the shower for about an hour. Uh, so <laughs> let's uh, let's. <laughs> oh, and actually, would love to say a massive good morning, hello to everybody. We have uh, Wu Tang Bear has joined us. I know that's not your name, but that's what I'm going to keep calling you. Um, <laughs> And yeah, everybody else, I know that I haven't been able to interact with chat as much as I would normally love to, but just know that we see you, we love you, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, don't forget, if you are enjoying the stream, do all of the internet things, like, share, comment, all that sort of stuff, or don't, I'm not your dad. But one thing that I would like you to do, dad or no, is go and subscribe to the Pure Tide YouTube channel. Uh, Kyle is doing some awesome shit over there, so go and show him some love. Uh, all right, so that was our, what was that? That was round three, end of day one. That was round, that was round four. Round four, uh, start of day two. Okay. Yeah. Going and into round I five. Against Necrons, Connecticut Court. Oh, um, fuck Necrons. <laughs> I'm sorry, but fuck Necrons. I... Uh, guess what? It's all right, Jay. Calm yourself. 
I didn't do no! the No, no, fake. <laughs> <laughs> it's I good to know that you beat them. I it, that does make me feel a little better. Absolutely picked this guy apart, limb metal limb from limb. <laughs> and I was just like, because he had Catans, he had Doomstalkers, he had two to raise. Oh, which the all... Hammerheads would love. Yeah. I literally just went, okay, cool. Stage, stage, ghost kill, ghost kill. Come at me, race. Race, stay there. Race, die. Perfect. Brilliant. Okay, Riptides, push on one flank. Hammerheads, I'm waiting. And the Hammerheads just basically, right, go away, Doomstalker. You've already loaned up to here. And then I just went in and just kept shooting, like, Nightbringers and and the Catan and stuff like that. And it was good. Half of them connected, did loads of damage. Breaches finished them off. And using my hammerheads in a different way, once I'd killed a Doomstalker, I was like, you know what? Full send hammerheads. I was like, what? I was like, yeah, I'm coming at you. Moving, moving the hammerhead and charging the hammerhead and blocking off an entire of a center objective and having three riptides, uh, two riptides and a ghost kill on the other and then making it so that he cannot control at least half of the objectives for his rerolls, which took away his efficiency. And then he unfortunately kept, he went tactical and he kept a couple of cards, which then I was able to play around. So he overwhelming force. I was like, oh, well, that, that unit's a little bit wounded, so I'm going to move that away and put some fresh units on the objectives. Um, and no prisoners. And I think he tried to shoot into a devilfish and with a one wound, but I kept rolling fives and sixes. To oh, save him. Like, no. <laughs> so you bully, which I fully <laughs> condone because it's a Necrons player. <laughs> so, um, I am going to like say that he kept on to overwhelming force and no prisoners for three turns and didn't score it. Oh, no. And then... Finally decided to ditch it, and then in round four got three on defense stronghold, and then on the last turn he still kept no prisoners and got four. <laughs> so basically he got seven out of forty on secondaries. A primary he got twenty, and um, it was scorched earth. So I just got four tens and a five at the end with a burning and objective, and then forty on secondaries. Oh, that is such a brutal set of draws. And I feel like there are some times where we can get in our own head about holding cards. I actually don't tend to do it that much because no. when my opponent knows what's open on the table exactly as you did, and I've said the same thing about why I don't like taking fixed, I don't like giving my opponent control over how I score. Mm -hmm. if, if, if my opponent can't predict me because I don't know what's going to happen, then that is just the best place to be in. Oh, that's yep. really unfortunate. I and oh. I kept assassinating my first thing because I drew secure no man's land and assassinate. So I scored secure no man's land and kept assassinate because I knew the race was going to come out to play and I'd definitely dick over one unit with a character in there. And that's yep. what I did. Um, ghost kills were amazing. They didn't even leave the midpoint because they just stood on the objectives with part of their model behind this cover and went, hi. Five turns later. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> Dude's just inside the ghost kill cockpit, just playing a switch or something. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I mean, one of them, one, one of them had a Catan, like just slapping him and the ghost kills just like playing Mario Kart and just being like, yeah, I don't care, bro. <laughs> 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 oh, no, I'm bleeping. I'm bleeping. I'm going to die. Drone dead. Cool. Next turn. <laughs> <Drone> dead. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so good. So that good. is so good. So that ends your round five, and we go into the final round. At this mm -hmm. point, you are four and one, uh, and to my knowledge, did not drop basically any points except for in the loss against Necrons, because obviously you had to drop at least one. Uh, yeah, yeah. And what are we looking at for your round six? Because this would so, be a player right, that yeah. should have a good win loss and strength of schedule. Yes. So um, I think the highest strength of schedules at the end of the event was me and um, the Space Wars player. Uh, yep. We were on like 69%, like 0.67. Wow. Yeah. Was, so okay. Yeah. Really strong field. And the Grey Knight player um, paired up. Um, so oh, poor dude. A poor guy, but very good player. His list effectively is doing a very similar thing that we're doing with Riptides. The mm. Dread Knights got cheaper. He had like oh, yeah. Libby, 
Libby's, Libby's, the um, character uh, that gives him plus three to charge, whatever it is. Keldor Drago. Yeah, and yeah, the Dread yeah. Knights, not only with the points reductions, but also the Psy Cannon getting an extra oh. pip of AP and ignore cover, functionally getting an extra minus two. Yeah, really good. Uh, Land Raider, um, Strike Team, and then the Special Inquisitor dude with his bros. Oh, um, yeah, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, sitting on the backfield and then uh, just other stuff. Um, and then terminate, two new Terminator years. So I knew about all of their movement shenanigans and the, the mists and stuff like that. And obviously, to um, be fair to Hellstorm Wargaming, they, they put on a really good event. And um, I'm not going to go too much into detail because I'd like you to go and show them some love and watch the stream. It's the day two one, about seven hours and 40 minutes in. Uh, if you want to go and watch the game. But I'll tell you a couple of things about that. So um, I looked at the list and you had to respect the threat ranges of their army because the Land Raider moves, they get out with the Assault Ramp and then can charge. So effectively, it's got a 27-inch threat range. So if you stay 27.1, um, you're not going to get charged. And then even if you kill the Land Raider, they can then go, oh, at the end of your turn, I'll just pick up units of my choice. Okay, and then come and deep strike in. So there is a massive potential for them to alpha strike. And those Dread Knights can advance, auto advance, um, and then still charge. Um, so they can go quite quick across and, the board. And so, importantly, Demon Hammers and Great Swords got an extra pip of uh, weapon yeah. skill. So it's not fours and threes. It is now threes and twos, respectively yeah. for the hammer being a little bit more because it's bigger and the Great Sword just being fantastic or oh, that might have only been on the grandmaster i will have to look that up actually while you're talking i will do that so we don't present incorrect information but uh yeah dread knights definitely need to watch out for that auto advance oh. they have advance and fall back and shoot and charge yeah, got so good so good and also they've got the flamers it's 2d6 strength 6 ap 1 ignoring cover so they're really good at clearing um chaff and stuff like that so they've got it all and when they advance their detachment rule gives them fly so yes. you can't even move block them in the traditional way you have to do the i'm gonna stand at the extent of your movement which is obviously so much less efficient because yes. you have to play around the all right if you go six not just you have a fixed value this is where i'm gonna stand yeah yeah so there's a couple of things in the, in the game like i want to state that when you look at an event as well um is six rounds where you're only used to five and five rounds is tiring enough six rounds it adds up so me and the player i would say that we didn't play our best we had a few little hiccups um in terms of stupid tactical mi mistakes uh, like i for example in mine i had my two cards that i drew cleanse and no prisoners right and i just put them to one side and i completely forgot that i had cleanse <laughs> so and i was like oh and you'll see a moment on stream where I kind of waffle, um, but what I'm actually meant to say in my head came out completely wrong. It was meant to say, they were like, what, can you spot and do actions? I went, uh, I was thinking about something else. I went, no, <laughs> but that, I can, obviously. You, yeah, what, yeah. <laughs> what, what I'd done in my head is I said no, because I was saying no in terms of I shouldn't be allowed to score these points because I looked at my point and went, why? And I was like, I didn't declare that I was doing cleanse. I just completely forgot that I had cleanse. I picked up my cards and went, no prisoners scored. Oh, wait, there's another card in there, cleanse. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> so I was stuck in this moment of like, I didn't technically say it. And the guy went, look, I'm, I'm not bothered. Like, could you have done it without me stopping? I went, yeah. And that Delphish moved over there to obviously do cleanse in this one, but I just didn't declare it. So I don't want you to feel under pressure. If you want to say no, feel, feel free. It's my mm -hmm. mistake. I'll own it. And he went, no, no, it's, it's fine. It's the last round. We're all tired. It's fine. So I was like, thank you. So then when they went off, because they took her mics off and stuff like that, and we were just resolving it, it's fine. Done. And then, you know, similarly, there was a situation where the ghost kill um, was, I talked to my opponent and I could move out of their range of moving, you know, and within nine inches, then he teleports away. Yeah. And it was like to the millimeter. But like, um, Mikey did a really fantastic job of being the TO for our game because obviously he's doing the stream and said, Look, I'm here to support you and help you. And he did just that. And obviously, chat were obviously responding and saying, like, Oh, um, trying to interact in the game. And obviously, Mikey's um, role was to not only facilitate us but also to help the chat understand what's going on mm. so he came and adjudicated a few things and it found out that there was like a millimeter in it 
Um, and then I was like, okay, cool, man. Yeah, well, that's fine. You can pick up the unit. That's cool. Yep. Done. And then that just made it go really smoothly that we had somebody to bounce off um, and it was helping with our fatigue. But the game in itself, um, we both went tactical because we're both really fast and it was vital ground. So I had a plan in my head. I was like, well, all I really need to do is bully the primary. If I go first, I need to really push out on the primary, get the points early doors. If I can secure two in no man's land and my home field, that's 12 points. And if he goes second, he'll have enough resources to do the same. So that puts our primary as a neck and neck and whoever scores secondary is better, you know, wins the game. I wasn't thinking damage. I wasn't thinking, you know, because I was respecting that their new Dread Knights can do quite a considerable amount of damage. Um, what ended up happening was um, my other part of my plan was to bait my opponent into focusing on this hand whilst the other hand just goes and gets me points and that's exactly what i did um you'll see that my positioning on the top left it might look like i'm losing resources for no reason but i was keeping him hemmed in the corner and dealing with breaches and devil fishes and riptides i made a few positional errors in my riptides to and i could have avoided like the mortal wound stuff coming from the libby um but that's just little after game thoughts that you think, why did I do that? I could have yeah, easily just yeah. had a couple of inches back and not taken any damage. Why did I do that? But we live and learn. But the main thing is that when I was doing all of that, he was clearing through the stuff. I was move blocking the Dread Knights so that their bases couldn't fit over my models because of the fly thing that you mentioned. And then on the other side, I just had a casual breach of fish just be like, ignore us, we're not here, we're not here. And there's a glorious moment where I'm like, It'd be really good if Catcher on the Outpost came up. And I was like, no. Oh, no, I got Overwhelming Force and some and behind him in lines. Well, I can't really kill what's on an objective there because I'm not really arsed. Sod it, I'm spending a CP. <gasps> Baby, Catcher on the Outpost came up. I was like, yes, get in. I just got behind him in lines for two units. That's five. <laughs> and Catcher on the Outpost, eight. And then just sat a unit of breaches in the Delfish on his home field objective, getting me six points every turn on primary. So I went from going, here's 13 points on my secondary, to then suddenly, oh, two for my home field, five, seven, plus six, 13 points. I'd already knew, I'd known that I like if he wasn't reacting to my primary plays, I'd won the game. And I think... The guy played it very, very well. He clearly knows his army, and he's a very skilled person. But I think a couple of decisions that he didn't make when it um, comes down to the primary kind of lost him that game. Um, because he had a moment where he could have retaliated and sent strikes or maybe diverted some of his force with the teleportations to go and reclaim his home field or prevent that from happening would have been the better play. Um, so... You know, I generally believe that the, the, the fatigue had kicked in, um, but I'd love to have a rematch with that guy in that game because I think Grey Knights can still punch above their weight class, and I think there's a couple of tactical decisions that they can do to really force errors upon uh, their opponent. And I think the, 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 the army works really well, and I think speed for speed... Tower really worried about armies that are faster than them or can constantly apply pressure. Your screens are only going to make you survive for so long. Once you start to run out of them, then they can get into the cookie jar. And with their three-inch deep strike thing and then the mortal wounds that they can do and they can still do actions, oh, it can add up. So, yeah, like, be aware, Grey Knights are not a pushover anymore. Um, they're really good. They were doing insanely well at my team's event and the GT where I placed in the top ten. Uh, the the person who won it was on Grey Knights, which, yeah. you know, they they have just so much stuff and all they needed was that little bump. And I have looked it up. It is threes for the hammer, twos for the great swords, regardless of whether you're a grandmaster or not. Yeah. And that is just so good. The side cannon and that with a few choice points cuts. And yeah, their Libby went up. But having said that, the Libby is still just fantastic. Really good. And so. yeah, a good Grey Knights play will absolutely be able to put in work. And sometimes it comes down to, and I, I love what you mentioned about the fact that, you know, it was round six. And I think this is something that certain ch people that go into a chat to watch a 40K stream, they're like, oh, cool. Well, I just woke up and I'm feeling real good and I'm watching some 40K. Oh, why didn't he do that? Why didn't he do that? He forgot to do his cleanse. He whatever. And you're like, dude, these guys have been playing for like 
maybe 10 to 12 hours a day and they're at the end of day two. Mental resilience and physical resilience within this game is absolutely a trainable skill. And it is not something that even, like you could be having the best day and even fall victim to it just because that's how fucking fatigue works. That's it. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. So like I, um, a couple of things as well, just to be kind of fair and keep the um, communication clear and us both on the same page and having a great time. I said to him, I was like, hey, look, honestly, like, thanks for letting me do that. I'm, I'm not really bothered. I think I shot some SMS that you were, I shouldn't have. I'll tell you what, put all the models I killed back. He went, huh? I went, just put that Terminator back. I shot it with a ghost kill and I could have just claimed that kill. I went, no, no even that guy, it's fine. I can't remember what I shot in terms of the yeah. SMSs. So, you know, I've killed that with a ghost kill, but sod it. Um, let's just crack on with the game, put the guy back, the Terminator back, and put those two models that I killed from your Inquisitor unit. That's cool. And he went, all right, yeah, sweet. And then there was a moment where a Pathfinder team fell out of a Devilfish, and we forgot a basic rule, which is your battle shot. And I used the minus two to charge strat. And then when it was, um, then Mikey was, how does that strat work? And we told him the strat, and he was like, oh, okay. And then he was like, oh, wait, the battle shot. So I went, oh, f oh, God, yeah, the battle shot. Um, and the opponent had already declared or done all his charges. I mean, mm. everywhere. Not just mm. that one instance, but everywhere. And I went, I tell you what, mate. Reroll all the charges. Start from afresh. Mm. And he was like, yeah, because I can't remember what, like, failed and passed. And actually, when, when I looked back at the stream, he'd actually failed them all mm. in, in, in order. Yep. And it wouldn't have mattered. But at that point, we didn't know because mm. we were just like, I don't I can't remember. And so I just went, just re-roll it all. And he was like, you sure? And I went, yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Honestly. Works both ways. I, 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 yes. I don't care. That it's is the absolute, absolute point of sportsmanship that I am not trying to rob you of something. I make a mistake. I make it better. And, yeah. it, dude, that's fantastic. That is fantastic. It was so annoying because I had, like, tokens in my bag somewhere. And I was like, I can't remember going over there. And they were, like, battle shock tokens, all this stuff that I love using, these little pure type tokens. I just didn't use them. And also, I forgot a basic rule, and so did he, about battle shock. And then we just went back. And it was that moment when it was caught. And, again, hats off to Mikey and the stream team because they're catching stuff that we as players are not cheating each other. We just forget sometimes. It's, it's yep. genuine. Absolutely it's happens. Genuine basic things so yeah redo all your charges not a problem and then from that it was smooth sailing there was no salty moments because we were both in check with each other and going i don't yeah. mind man yeah of yeah. course let's just redo this let's do redo that it's not a problem that's fine don't worry about it and and that level of um sportsmanship and fair play and just general having a good time and trying to not just be like oh well i'm sorry you've not done that and then it's like oh okay well i can't be bothered anymore and also stream pressure as well. We, we both haven't been on stream in a long, long, long time. Oh, so like, stream pressure is so real. It, yeah. But anyway, it was oh. a really good game. Um, really enjoyed it. A really good opportunity to show off the hammerheads. And there was a glorious moment where a riptide might have exploded and killed lots of stuff, including mm. my own shit. Mm. So go and watch the game. Um, you'll see a lot more of it. But, you know, by, rather than just listening to us talk about it, go and watch it on the Hellstorm Wargaming Day 2 of the Goonhammer one. About seven hours and 40 minutes in, you can fast forward, you'll see it happening. Um, and then that game was, um, they incorrectly scored it, um, but it was 78 to 59. I think they had it as uh, 75 to 55 or something like that. But right, yeah. Matter. But um, yeah, that rounded out. And uh, I've got some um, really good news, I might as well say now. Um, and I found out last night, um, Josh Roberts had won the event, so he got the golden ticket. But this menace had already won an event at Nottingham um, Super Major, and he's just had it confirmed that he gets a golden ticket from there. So the golden ticket has been handed down to second place. So your boy's got a golden ticket. Let's fucking um, go! Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome, dude. Strike. Only took long strike and a hammerhead in SMS to bring me that. So, so now, I'm yeah, totally everybody sure. that wants to slide into my DMs and be like, see, I told you, I told you, he got a golden <laughs> ticket because he took hammerheads. I told you that. Yeah. <laughs> well done, it's the new town meta. But Mate, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm not stopping there. I'm not going to give any reveals because it's top secret, hush, hush. Uh, but there is an event at the end of the month, uh, the Manchester Super Major and I am still taking long strike and a hammerhead. That I will reveal. But there is some additional spice that I'm adding in. That is something again that I've not used before. Um, and I'm gonna be trying it. My patrons know what it is. So if you are literally like, oh come on, I can't wait. Come on, come and join. 
Come and join my Patreon side of things in the Pure Tower program, and I'll tell you all about these crazy lists that I've got. And there's one of them maybe with quad hammerheads. That's something that I will reveal. Um, but the other one is a different style of spice, and I can't wait to use it. That is wonderful. Well, Carl, mate, that will bring us up to the end of our time. That is, we are looking at a two-hour stream that honestly went insanely fast. And I feel like this is when I know that I'm talking to somebody that I share a lot in common with because time becomes a nil factor. I remember our first stream, we're like, oh, we'll keep it reasonable, we'll keep whatever. And then we're like, two and a half fucking hours later or something like that. <laughs> but mate, I want to say a big congratulations on the second place, the golden ticket. Uh, really, really incredible to see uh, that it doesn't actually matter whether somebody says something is good or bad. If you are skilled enough in an army, you can take stuff that you like or that you have a plan for and it will work out because you put in the time, you put in the hours, you understand the matchups and mate, that is absolutely fantastic. Before I go into plugging myself, mate, are there any shout outs you want to make? Obviously you have your fantastic discord and your Patreon that you mentioned. Uh, is there anything else you would like to shout out to all the awesome people in the stream, which all of our chatters, lurkers, Hangers, our Wu Tang Bears, thank you very much for being here. Uh, mate, any shout outs? Yeah, absolutely shout out to my, to my community and my Discord. You're all so supportive of what I do. And I think that it's easy for me to say, right, guys, come and join X, Y, and Z and do the plugging. But um, it's important to remember that without you guys supporting me and kind of like really kind of egging me on, um, I wouldn't be in this position. So I'm eternally grateful for this and I can't thank you enough. But for those people that support me, thank you so much. I uh, may like, I kind of continue this reign of success and keep trying new things. And it really fills me with pride when I'm at events, knowing that I've got a community backing me. Um, I've always been one of the community, even on Facebook in the early days and sharing my successes. And I will continue to do so. My promise to you guys, the community is I will continue to innovate and challenge convention and basically give you different ways of playing the army that you love. And obviously if you are sat on the fence, look, I'm approachable in come and join my discord. You can join on the link. It's you can choose a chassis if you don't want to jump straight into the paid pay, paid Patreon side of things. And if you want to find out more, just at me um, or DM me, and I'm gladly take some of my time away and speak to you about the options. So very much keen to kind of work with you. But apart from that, that's pretty much it. What about you, James? What would you like um, to plug? Well, just on that, I will say that I don't think there's a morning that I've woken up without a notification from the Pure Tide Program Discord. So Kyle is absolutely like active as fuck on there. It almost gives me fatigue looking at how much he's doing. Uh, <laughs> so, I find it. <laughs> so absolutely fantastic. Uh, mine is going to be a shout out to all of my uh, patrons and YouTube members who make all of my videos possible. Uh, if you would like to join us, get access to the discord, head to the links in the description uh, in the bottom right of your screen, you will see the uh, link to go to Kyle and support him and show him some love and show the pure type program make sure you go to his youtube uh and if you would like to join our raffle and potentially win either a two-hour coaching session with me or a full game played on tts where potentially i could take the gloves off and you could see how you square up head to the website that you can see just below where our cameras are and grab yourself a ticket or fifty thousand to the raffle uh, mate, that is everything from me. I want to thank everybody that has joined us in chat. Thank you so much. Everybody that's watching this as a VOD, you guys are incredible. Uh, Collegiate Titanic of Pater, glad you made it at the end, mate. This will be up as a VOD immediately. I want to thank everybody, and we will see you in the next one. Thank you so much, Commander Pure Tide.